Hello and welcome to the very first episode of I Could Never Be here on AfterBuzz TV and Popcorn Talk. I am so excited that you guys have joined us. And I'm so excited to hear from some of the guests that we have lined up. We're going to be doing a show every week. This show is meant to motivate you. It's kind of meant to inspire you. And most importantly, it's meant to connect you to the people that you maybe see on your television screens, in movie theaters, you know, those people who are playing music on big stages in bigger arenas all around the world, those people who are leading Fortune 500 companies, those people who have started businesses, a wide range of people who are successful. And I use the term successful because that's kind of how this show started. You know, I could never be really started from hearing friends look at these people who they have deemed to be successful and they're comparing themselves to them, which is not a bad thing, but they were doing it in the wrong way of looking at the people and saying, well, I could never be so-and-so and I could never be so-and-so because, oh, they had something that I didn't or they had a handout or they knew someone who gave them an opportunity or somehow their path was easier than the one that I'm facing. And the more I thought about that, I, you know, I, I didn't buy that theory because I know that everyone, no matter who you are, no matter how successful, everyone has faced that point in life where they've hit that wall, where they've asked themselves the question, is this really what I want to do? Is this worth it to keep putting the time, the money, the effort, the blood, sweat, and tears into something? And really, do I want to continue? So I want to be able to share those stories with people uh, about these people who we, we deem to be successful. You know, my hope is that in by hearing by you hearing their stories of overcoming obstacles, that you will be able to overcome the obstacles in your own life. You know, it's easy to see the negative and why something won't work, but we're here to help you kind of realize why it will. So without ado, I'm really excited for my very first guest today. He is someone who has just been killing the music game. He's a drummer. He is a drummer for Everride, which is putting out some amazing music. You're going to hear their song, Heartless, as we open the show. They really are incredible. But before that, he was a drummer for a band that you might have heard of. They actually set the record for the highest grossing tour ever by a vocal group, $290 million. They were playing in front of 80 and 90,000 people. One Direction, please help me welcome Josh Devine. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you for coming in. How are you doing? You having a good day? Great, yeah. Better now. This is amazing. Did you know about the the highest grossing that that was the highest grossing tour ever? Yeah, I remember. I remember reading it. Like no one ever told me anything. <laughs> I, was, I just remember reading it on, on the internet, and uh, I was like, "Yeah, it's pretty sounds about right." And uh, I think it was like 69 shows, 68, 69 uh, shows in remember. that tour. It was. It was. Yeah, it was a lot. And we're talking about playing in front of 80, 90 thousand people. And we were talking yeah. a little bit before the show that mm. that. That, that sets in in the moment or it doesn't set in in the moment? Yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those things where I think as we were saying, it, it, you're in the moment and you try and take in as much as you can to be like, this is incredible. I need to, you know, really savor every minute of it. But you don't truly understand how incredible it is until you look back and you see pictures or videos or you speak to people that were involved in it. And then you're like, oh, wow, like we did that. That's that's incredible, you know. And you're still seeing those pictures and the video. Oh yeah, um, you know, I get tweeted stuff like that every single day. I mean, I still get messages like pictures and videos from like 2012, 2011 when, when <laughs> we first started doing stuff. With, Back when the hairstyle know. was different. Oh yeah, I had the. Uh, <laughs> The, I like to call it the Justin Bieber cut, you know. Yeah. Back, back, back when he had the Everybody sweet. had that, so you're not alone. That was great. It, it kind of made me look a lot younger as well, which is like, I don't know, I guess at the time I thought that that was what was cool. <laughs> That's just what suited me. We all look back at those things and be like, oh, the, this, no, this was cool in the time. I promise you, this was cool in the time. It was. I mean, I've had some pretty interesting hairstyles over the years as well. So, mm. uh, and then I, I always look back, I'm like, eh, it was kind of cool. Holly's shaking her head going, nope, definitely. <laughs> yeah, <your laughs> some of them were not cool. Your girlfriend's in here, and she kind of put up with uh, kind of some, maybe some of those hairstyles at the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Some of them where she very looked very questionable at me. But, yeah, I, I mean, including the pink now, actually, I'm going to be honest. Yeah. It was red, but it's faded, so but it's cool. Yeah, You got to stand out. And you guys are standing yeah. out now. I want to be able to talk about, about Everride. Mm. Uh, which is the new band that you guys are in, you, Hayden, and Sean. Yeah. Uh, and talk to me about kind of how this started, because, you know, it's been a year, you said, in eight, nine months since you last played with One Direction. Mm. And did you always kind of want to form uh, a new band, uh, be able to kind of get your own music? Yeah, I mean, 
I guess ever since I was a kid, I've, I've been in so many bands growing up where I just wanted to be able to make cool music that I just loved playing and stuff that I, I'd listen to. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just kind of been a dream for so long, but I've just never found the right people to do it with. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously being with, with One Direction, that, that was like a session gig. That, that was, you know, I, you're almost being employed to be with these guys. It's not, it's not like this was my band that I like formed and did all that. You know, the band was the Five Boys. We were just there to kind of, you know, play the music and to kind of back them up and support them. Um, so, yeah, I think as soon as I came off the road, actually, I rang, I rang Hayden and I was like, dude, I'm going to be in L.A. Let's meet up for lunch. I'd, I'd, I'd love to chat with you about something. And I've known Hayden for like five years. Uh, he actually supported uh, One Direction on our first European tour, I think. He, he was in the support band. Um, so, you know, I've always been like, wow, this guy's he's an incredible guitar player. This guy's killing it. I'd, I'd love to be in a band with him. You know, we just get each other musically so well. Um, and we literally, I think over lunch one day, we just decided, let's uh, let's start a band. And he's like, yeah, dude, because he does, he does the, the, the same thing. He's played for people like Demi Lovato, uh, the band Perry, mm -hmm. Dea. You know, he, he does, I think he did Jennifer Lopez at one point. You know, he's, he's a big time dude. So we're both like, well, we both got this wealth of experience. Let's come together and make like this band of like session guys that mm -hmm. come in and, and write our own music because we all write music. So yeah, it, 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 it's a completely different thing to being kind of hired. It's, you know, finally this is something where it's our own little baby almost that we're nurturing and we're going to grow. And yeah, it's, it's truly a really exciting thing. What has it been like? You know, you guys have been together for, you know, several months, kind of writing almost, music. Well, getting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, getting stuff together. What has that been like? It's it's been it's been different. It's been interesting. It's uh we've got, you know, three there's three of us in the band, so and we've all three got very different kind of views and styles of music that we really love. So it's uh yeah, it's it it it's a really interesting concept whenever we get in the studio together because we all write differently as well. Like I like to write as a band sitting together all three of us, you know, we're all playing our instruments going for it. Whereas Sean, our singer likes to sit there with some acoustic guitars and kind of work out lyrics and stuff, and that's how we start the, the song. So it's been a learning curve, I think, for all of us to kind of sit down and, and get out of our comfort zones and all of us, you know, learn to really sing together and learn to perform together in, like, an acoustic environment and to get in with other big producers. And, and you know, it's it's been a really interesting but super fun journey so far. And then Heartless, what's the meaning behind Heartless? Obviously, it's a song that kind of, like, overcoming you know, yeah. obstacles a little bit. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, getting to that real low point in your life where there's, you know, there's no hope and then it's finding that thing that gets you out of it and, and finding that, like, way to overcome what you're going through, you know. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, Sean is, has an amazing way with lyrics. He's, uh, he's a very, very, very clever, like, he, he just works things out and has a real good way of saying stuff, so... Uh, yeah, I think I think it comes across quite quite well when you listen to it. It definitely makes you feel a certain way. Yeah, and the band name Everide, mm. I found out yesterday is actually the name of a child that you sponsored. Yeah, which is incredible. Yeah, how did, did you did you want that to be kind of encompassed into the band, or be able to maybe have that as a constant reminder? It was weird. It it never really crossed my mind until I was actually there in Rwanda with this boy Everide. And um, we were searching for like a band name at the time. We, we had a load of really awful band names. <laughs> I mean, one of them, which was called Carpet. I mean, who well, wants to call their band Carpet? Let's be honest. Like, shag Carpet or what kind of carpet are you thinking? You see, when I think of the word Carpet, I just think of this like weird, like kind of off mustard colored <laughs> carpet. So I was like, no, I was like, no, we need something cool. Um, and actually, we filmed a documentary in Rwanda, and it was one of the camera guys um, who was on this, this trip with us said to me, he goes, bro, Everide is such a cool name. I was like, yeah, like, it really is. He goes, there's your band name, bro. I was like, wow. Mm. I was like, okay, that's, that's you know, that's, that's interesting. At first, I thought, like, yes, this is incredible, but I thought, oh, I've got to ask the other two. Now. I, can't, I can't just say, this is what we're called. Um, and I put it to the other guys, and, and, and Hayden was like, done. That's the best thing. It's got an amazing story. Um, yeah, that's, that, that just means so much. And Sean was a little bit more like, yeah, I'm not sure. He was connected to carpet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think he was just holding on to that carpet dream. <laughs> 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 it 
<laughs> no, he um yeah, he I, th- I think when he when he saw the documentary and and saw what it was like, he was like, "You know what, dude, this is like this is an awesome thing to do." So I was like, "Yeah, cool. Let, let's do it." And it just kind of evolved from there. Everyone everyone seems to really dig the name and uh yeah, it, it really has an amazing story behind it and and it it's you know, super sentimental to me cuz uh you know, that 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 kid is is incredible and he you know, really changed the way I look at life as well. When I went out to go and see him and I saw how he had nothing. I mean, I'm talking like nothing. He sle- he sleeps in a hammock mm-hmm. with like his brothers and sisters and all that. Um, they have a cow and a, I think a couple of chickens. And he has a football, a, so- a soccer ball, we call it football, mm-hmm. um, that he made out of banana leaves. And it's about this big. And he actually gave it to me. Wow. Which is like, um, I've, I've got it in my room. It's like my one of my prized possessions, yeah. you know. Um, and in turn, I gave him a soccer ball, like like a real soccer mm-hmm. ball as well. And I was like, seeing the look of him in his face when he got it, he was like, this is incredible. And I was like, dude, everyone out here, especially in LA, everybody is like, you know, looking up and being like, oh, that guy's driving a Lamborghini. Oh, that guy's got, you know, a $50,000 watch on. It all means nothing, like really, you know. Yeah. And these people that have all this huge wealth and stuff, you see them and they live such unhappy, unfulfilling lives and not not everyone, I'm not generalizing. Mm-hmm. No, but, no, no, no. You know, I'm just saying, then you meet someone who's who's in poverty and... True poverty. Like, real poverty. Yeah. You know, and they're just so happy. Mm-hmm. And I was, I, was, I was shocked. I was like, dude, these guys have got more worries in the world than most of us put together would have. And yet he wakes up every day, smiles, you know, he's thankful for what he's got. He loves his family and they live the lives that they feel is, is the best way that they can live. Will that always stay with you in terms of mm. like that attitude of, of comparing, you know, what we live and what we maybe consider to be trouble versus what they would consider to be trouble? Definitely, yeah. I think, uh, I think it, it's very hard not to get caught up in the, the kind of, I guess you can call them first world problems of, you know, you're always longing and wanting for something mm-hmm. and, and money stuff and financial things and, and, you know, always wanting nice stuff and, and all that. I think everyone can relate to, you know, to, to that. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I just feel whenever I get a little bit ahead of myself of that kind of thing or whenever I feel like I'm getting a bit overwhelmed uh, with really trivial things, I think back and I'm like, you know what? I'm super blessed, man. Life's, life's so good. And I just want to be able to, like, share that with everyone and let everyone know that, you know, there's a people going through a lot of harder times mm-hmm. than you, so you got to really, you know, when you're going to sit and complain about your day and your life, really think about what you're complaining about and realize, you know, it's never that bad, you know. Uh, Does Ever I Know that that's the name of the band? Does the kid no, know? No, not, not, not yet. I'm going to plan to go back next year, um, and I'll, I want to tell him in person. I mean, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure if... if, if I'm not sure if he'll be able to comprehend the scale of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, he doesn't have internet or mm-hmm. or, or, yeah. or anything thing like that. That's probably and why he's so happy. He doesn't have Twitter. That's that's probably <laughs> it. He doesn't have to keep up this whole social facade. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. So I I, I want to tell him in person. And uh, I mean, my dream is for like, you know, if if one of our songs goes, you know, does really really mm-hmm. well. Um, I'd, yeah, I'd love to be able to be like, hey, dude, like, you know, you're part of this legacy. You're part of our story, and it's an amazing story. So, yeah, and I, I know it's going to make him super proud because I mean, he's he's 12 now, so he's still wow. he's still a young boy. Um, so yeah, I think one day I want to I want to fly him out here and show him life over here. You know, yeah. When when he's old enough, I it's so true to be there. able to just to to have those reminders how important that is. And I was sharing with you like I sponsor a boy named Joy in mm. Bangladesh. And it keeps you grounded to be able to have that. Definitely, yeah. I think I think com- completely. It gives you, it gives you almost like a, a a sense of purpose. Like, you know, you're you're you know you're you're making a difference, and especially when you get you know like like you know you'll receive a letter or something mm-hmm. written yeah. from, and it's not like one of these people that you know you, you just see a certain amount go out of your account every month and mm-hmm. you never hear from them or yeah. you have a little postcard on your wall or something. It's like an actual real living person that's like, you know, interacting with you. It's mm-hmm. I think think it's such an incredible, incredible thing. Uh, I think you're changing their lives, but they are one hundred percent changing our lives. One hundred percent. Yeah, I think even I mean I feel even more so. We're just giving a bit of money. Yeah, they're giving us like a whole 
you know, it's just an incredible experience. I think it's it's yeah it's truly mind blowing. Food for the hungry is the organization mm. too, which is incredible. And you went on a trip, like you said, and you were able to go visit him, and which is awesome, and still supporting a village, and, and you now you're yeah. supporting another child there, yeah, uh, as well, which is great. Uh, I want to take it back maybe to when you were a child. You started mm -hmm. drumming at three years old. Three, yeah. That maybe is hard to <laughs> comprehend. Of how <laughs> do you even begin to drum at three years old? Well, my dad was in the music business. Mm -hmm. um, he was a singer in a band that did quite well in the UK. Um, so I remember it was one of my earliest memories, actually. My dad was in a recording session in a studio in London. I think it was just outside of London. And... Um, the, the drummer had left his kit set up while they broke for lunch. And I remember walking up and, and making my dad sit down on the kit and let me play. Uh, and we have a video of it somewhere stored away wow. that, that I need to get us out. But um, I sat there on his lap. He did all the like the pedals and stuff, and I just sat there and just grooved away. And uh, I mean, at, at the time, I thought... Could you I'd reach play... the pedals? I couldn't, no. I had okay. to, sit, I had to sit, sit, sit on my dad's knee. But uh, uh, I mean... Yeah, I just I just grooved away, and I knew from that moment I was like, "This is," you know. I thought I sounded pretty good at that time. I'm probably gonna watch I, the no, video I bet back. You did. No, no, no. I bet you did. I could, I could, I could hold a beat when I was a kid, definitely. <laughs> and then when I was four, my parents for my uh, for Christmas or my birthday, one of the two, they gave me uh, my first little mini drum kit. But it was like a proper, a proper yeah. kit, and uh, and they couldn't shut me up ever since, basically, which is. You know, I'm sure they regretted it at some point, but... Was there ever a time, I mean, it, starting from four, I mean, that's a young age, and, you know, people are, you know, they grow up and they're like, oh, I want to be an NBA player, I want to be that. Like, did it ever change? Did your passions ever change? Or was there ever a, a moment of doubt or considering doing something else? There, I mean, yeah, throughout throughout my whole life, I guess, ever since, since I was, like, a baby, I always wanted to be a drummer. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to bang things. It was just always what I thought I was going to do. And whenever teachers would ask me, at school, you know, especially growing up when you're like early in school. Also, what do you, what do you want to do when you're older? I'm like, right, I either want to, you know, be a, a soccer player because every kid in the UK at that age wants to be a football yeah. player, um, or a drummer. And it was always like, I want to be a drummer. That's the thing, you know. I was never good enough to be a soccer player, but I knew I had something in me that could be a drummer. And it just progressed. That that was always my answer, you know. I wasn't the best at school. Um, I wasn't like the brightest tool in the shed per se, like academically. But I was never worried. I was never, like, too freaked out about, like, my grades and my results and stuff because I just thought, oh, it's fine. I'm going to be a drummer. Like, you know, one way or another, this is going to happen, whether whether it takes me forever or not, you know. Um, but there was definitely moments, especially coming out of school. I left school at 16. Um, really? So coming out of school, and I started going to... Like, dropped out of school <laughs> at 16 or, like, finished early or what are you... We, we finish, like compulsory education at 16 in the okay. UK and then usually you stay on for two years and do what we call sixth form which is like I guess the last two years of, of high school that you guys would do mm -hmm. or, I don't know what you guys call it yeah um so I didn't do that they I, well I wanted to do it they would not let me do that um probably I mean due to the fact that I probably wasn't the best student mm -hmm. um <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah and 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 also I I do remember them very vividly being like well, I mean, we can't really help you do what you want to do. Like, you know, you're better off, like, going to find in, like, a college that specializes in, 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 in that because, mm -hmm. you know, you won't really, I mean, it's, it's a tough thing. You're not really going to make it kind, kind of thing, which is always a, a bit like, ah, damn, that kind of sucks. Like, Did you have people telling you you're not going to, like, you should oh, try yeah. something else? Dude, since, since, like, since I was a kid, everyone, you know, there's, I've, I've always had very supportive parents. My mom and dad have always been super, like, you know, Dude, put, put your mind to it. You can do it. You can mm -hmm. do it. You can do it, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, teachers across the board since, since since I was a kid, everyone thinks it's just a dream. And, you know, I guess, you know, it's one in a million really do make it of what they love doing. Wow. And I was always just like, well, someone's got to be the one in a million, haven't they? So, like, why not me? You know, I've got, I've got as much chance as anyone else. Um, but, I mean, I never lived in London. That, that you know, I had all this stuff going against me. Or so I thought, like, I never lived in London. I never, you know, I just I just kind of always had this, like, mental block in my head of, oh, I'm, I, you know, it's going to be really hard. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. It's just going to happen. And um, I remember being, I'd say, 18, 19, and I got my first, like, proper big gig and I've, I'd, I'd played with tons of bands back in you know since school 
I played with some really cool artists as well. That's you know everything kind of was like a stepping stone that that led to this this moment where I started playing for a, a UK rapper called Skepta, who's mm -hmm. incredible, like super super like awesome, and I I loved his music anyway. So when uh, when I got asked to play for him with a friend of mine, Charlie Drew, who I actually he was a singer songwriter, and, and I used to play with him as well. Um, we all kind of got asked to be as like support band. Um, and that was the moment when I was like, okay, something's happening. This is cool. You know, we, we, pl we did like a UK tour and it was like, you know, we played on the radio and this was like a really big thing for me. But then between that, there was two tours we did between those two tours. There was like a big span of months where I wasn't doing anything. And I was trying and trying, you know, trying to get as much work in as I could. And it just got to the point where I was like, look, I'm broke. I'm not gonna. I can't afford, you know, I can't afford anything. I can't afford five bucks to put gas in my car. So I'm walking everywhere and, you know, I, I never wanted to take money from my parents. I never wanted to do, you know, I need to support myself. I need to do, you know, like I had a roof over my head mm -hmm. with, with, with them and, and, and they were always amazing to me. So what is it, you have five, I mean, to be able to have that little amount of money, I mean, what's going through your head? How do you think I'm going to, you know, advance with that kind of money? Well, you can't, I mean, I was just kind of like, okay, I've got to try and get a normal job, but I, I need to stay open. Like, I'm pretty sure everyone, especially like in places like LA, every, everyone's yeah. trying to find that gig that they that, that, that need time for the audition. So no one wants to go and commit themselves to a full-time job because, you know, they need to be flexible to, to, do, to do all this stuff. And I was the same. So I used to just bounce between like random jobs. I mean, I've, I've built, you know, I've helped build houses. I've put solar panels on roofs. I went through like a... a really strange like thing of just doing a load of different jobs and I'd just do it for a week and then do something else and do something else I could never stick to something because I just I, I wasn't happy and you yeah. know I was getting a paycheck through and it was a little money but I was like this sucks like I you know and I'm not knocking anyone that does that for no. a living but I just for me I just I was like I'm just not happy I, I've got a dream and I need to do it and I did get to the point where my dad I remember sat me down he's like dude if this, you know, you need something to happen drumming wise, you need to either push yourself harder and, and get out there and somehow do something. Um, or I think it's time you packed it in. And to hear my dad say that was like a bit of like a, ah, this really, you know, I, I was in a bad place wow. mentally. Cause I was like, this is the guy who's like fully the whole time been like, you can do this, you can do this. And he gave me like a real kick up the ass to be like, come on, you need to do this. Um, and then was he saying it? Have you talked with him? Was he saying that knowing that you could and he was trying to push you to that next level? Or was definitely. he being OK? Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, he was never like, you know, this, this isn't going to work. Like, stop. He was he was always super like, you know, you can do it. But, you know, for whatever reason, you know, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. And that was one big thing. And it's kind of been the story of my life. I've always like I, I've never really completely fully immersed myself to push myself always to be like, you know, mm -hmm. solely driven until until you know i got to that that stage where i was like right it literally is all or nothing i have to give all or nothing otherwise this is not going to work um and then yeah, no, you know you know it, it's just as social media was just starting to boom it was just as everything was starting to get up so it was a whole new world and concepts so i was like right i gotta you know start filming videos of me drumming stick them on youtube send them to and annoy as many people as i can to be like hey you're playing some gigs if you need a drummer pick pick me you know mm -hmm. um and yeah, it was it was strange because going from that first tour with the rapper Skepta, um, all my friends and, and everyone else suddenly see you like, oh, he's doing stuff now. He's got money. He's doing this. So mm -hmm. you've also got this like image to battle, which is like a huge, a huge thing. I think today in, in, in these worlds, you see all these kids who do something, get a viral video, they make a ton of money and then they go through these major hard times, but they want to still seem like they're doing so well. So they go and buy a load of stuff that they really can't afford or live yeah. this expensive lifestyle. And I got a little bit caught in that trap where I was like, right, people think I'm like this now, so I need to like maintain this. You know, I always need to have the like latest stuff. I need to drive the coolest cars, I need to do all this. So uh, it, it was just one of those real like, uh, don't wanna bash my pride by, you know, trying to, you know, seem like I'm not doing as well. Yeah. So, so I, I, I never really, you know, let it out that, you know, like, hey guys, I'm looking for work, someone, someone employ me, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm a desperate drummer here. Um, and it's true with, with music, you know, you're even like, you know, now with Everide, when you're writing 
you know, stuff. You're investing in yourself, but you're not, those writing sessions aren't paying. No. You know, you're not getting I paid wish. to do that. <laughs> you're, you're spending money and you're having to invest in yourself. Yeah. Yeah, com com completely. It is literally an investment. It, it is like the three of us, uh, you know, the Shark Tank people that are investing in a company that, that, that that's come through. It's it's one of those um, weird moments where we don't know if it will succeed. You know, we kind of, you know, we believe it will and we, we hope it will. And we've definitely got what it takes to, to, to make it to the top. But we could be pouring all the money into it and it could never do anything. That's just the reality of it, you know. But it is just that it's um you know when we're not getting paid to do this we're, we're doing this out of our own pocket because we just love the music and we know that this is what it, it's going to have to take you know yeah um but yeah that's 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 a tough thing still growing up you know and you're you're talking about when you're starting and getting uh, uh with specter and you're getting with the other bands and even now you know what does practice entail you know, is, it, is that literally you just sitting? Because a lot of times you're not with other people mm. for practice. Are you just drumming on your own? Or what is what does practice like on a day-to-day -day basis entail for you? It Well, growing up, it was like, I mean, I'd come home from school and I'd sit and just bash out on the drums for hours, you know. There was never really a point of time where my parents had to say, hey, you need to go and practice. I was always drumming. That, mm -hmm. that was my thing. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I used to practice like, you know, sometimes between an hour and three hours a day and then... Other times, as my career was, was progressing, it was more like I could sit on the kit for four hours, five hours. I mean, there's been days when I've had to rehearse where I've been playing for nine, ten hours. And, I mean, it's a workout. It's, a, it's, yeah. it's hard. I mean, my hands are destroyed from drumming for the last 23 years. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, But, yeah, I mean, it's it's tough. Nowadays, especially with the band as we're writing and we're doing a lot of, of other stuff, it is quite hard to find the time to really sit there and put that much time an effort into it. especially I mean being an adult now and having to you know especially for me living in a new country and and you know adapting to life over here I can't just spend every single minute in the studio I'd love to spend every single minute yeah. just sitting playing drums you know it's like a release for me it's like a stress build up it just gets released so yeah it's I, I definitely don't practice as much at the moment but when I do it's like it's heavy sessions you know sometimes it's like four or five hours and usually it's like from 10 p.m. till 2 or 3 in the morning. Is that lonely because you're by yourself? Is that ever get lonely or? Uh, yeah. I mean, when I'm drumming, no. Like, yeah. like when I'm actually playing, not not really because, I mean, you're so caught up in the moment and it's like you get put into a trance. You know, you, 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 you're focused and you, you're making music and you get sort of taken away to this other place. It's not like I don't ever feel like, oh, I'm sitting down and playing. I'm like, I'm loving every minute of it, you know, and the time flies, so it doesn't get too lonely. Although I've, I've started when I'm, I'm actually on my own for a lot of the time of the day. Mm -hmm. I have started talking to myself sometimes. So I think that, that, that is probably a sign that I'm not meant to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I Maybe think I'm just much. going crazy. Tell me about uh, the, how you got with One Direction. Because, you know, they, they had, kind of had auditions. <laughs> yeah. And you were booked on the first audition, if I read that correctly, or how did it go? Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was one of those things. It was actually a really, a really strange thing. After my dad had spoken to me about about the whole like you know come on you need to really push yourself mm -hmm. and really and really do that and gave me the motivation that I really needed, out of the blue, literally out of the blue, I had a, a guy that, that that I friend requested on Facebook maybe two years prior just pop up and message me. He's like, "Hey dude, um, what are you doing Saturday?" And I was like, mm, "Nothing." You know, I'm kind of just laying in bed on a Wednesday morning like, "Oh, what am I going to do today?" And, you know. I was like, nothing. And he goes, dude, there's this really cool uh, TV show happening for this this band from X Factor, One Direction. Like, are you free? Mm -hmm. I was like, I remembered One Direction off the show. I never I never watched that that, that much of their mm -hmm. season, but I remember them. So I was like, dude, yes. Like, I'd love to play drums on TV, thinking like, okay, this is, this is something interesting. Yeah. And um, he was like, okay, cool. I'll send your headshots over and we'll see if they like it. And he came back to being like, cool. Get there at 9.30 to the studio in London. You're doing it. This is the song. And sent the song that they were just coming out with, which was their first single, What Makes You Beautiful, mm -hmm. um, which was like the worldwide big hit. And I remember hearing, I was like, okay, this is super pop. This isn't what I'm usually about. You know, I'm, I'm a lot more into the rock stuff. So I was like, okay, it's just fun. Like I'll, I'll, I'll drum on it. It's, it's, it's a fun thing. I did that and it was a TV show called Red or Black, which is like a huge deal in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was kind of it. And there'd been talks when I was on set that I was, that I was like, oh, 
yeah, these, these, these guys are going to go on tour. These guys are going to do, do, do all this, you know? And there's like a thousand fans waiting outside. So it was weird as I was walking in, like people are screaming at all these boys. I was like, my days, who are these kids? Like, this is, <laughs> you know. And then they saw me associate with them. So when I'd walk out, they'd all be like, you know, asking me questions. That I mean, was the I'm, first taste? Yeah, and it was the weirdest. I was like, how can anyone scream this this loud over a kid with curly hair? Like, <laughs> <laughs> over the, you know, and but it was like, they were super nice. Harry, I remember, came into our dressing room and, and he was just like super chill and like, you know, he was he was a kid, he was like 16. Yeah. I think I was 19 at the time or 20. I think, think, think I was 20. So I was like, to me, these guys are kids. Yeah. And I was like, wow, like th th these guys are kids, but like grown up kids, you know, in the way they present themselves. I was like, I really like these guys. They're just good human beings. Um, and then I remember getting a phone call uh, on my phone from the, the MD, but I didn't have the number. And there was actually a load of radio stations, local radio and news stations trying to get hold of me. Somehow they all had my number. So I was having a load of numbers get on my phone from playing on TV. Not, not many people from the little town that, that I lived in before okay. I moved here go on TV or anything. So it was, I, th I guess it was kind of a big deal to mm -hmm. them. So, you know, and I was like, well, this is so cool. Yeah, I'll take every interview. This is great. Um, and yeah, it just got to the point where I was just having to dodge calls because they wouldn't leave me alone. And I let one of this one of the calls go to voicemail, and it was our MD for the tour, uh, John, and and he was just like, hi, um, yeah, I just wanted to know if you'd be interested in coming down and auditioning for um, the One Direction live show we're we're doing like a few months at the beginning of next year, which is two thousand, um, I think it was the end of two thousand eleven, going into two thousand and twelve, just one tour. So I was like. Wow, and my friend actually deleted the voicemail by accident. So I was, you know, he thought it was on a phone call, so he just hung up. He pressed the red button. He was like, "What have I done?" Uh, you know, oh, I, wow. I was still never let him live it down. That was like one of those moments <laughs> yeah, where I'm, no. I'm walking in the supermarket. I was like, "Are you for real? Like this could have been my one chance, and you almost destroyed it." <laughs> uh, but I, I managed to find his number again, and I gave him a call. Went down to the audition, and it was uh, nerve wracking as hell. It was, it was one of those moments when you're like, you know. I'm parked up outside, I've got my time slot, and I saw this other drummer who I loosely knew, because I'd cause i seen him all over social yeah. media, and he, he had way more followers than me at the time. He you know, was always posting that he's doing things, he knows all these famous people, so I was intimidated. And I remember he came out of the audition, and I'm sitting in my, in my little car, and, uh, and he came out and he gave his girlfriend a hug, and I was like, I've got this. He goes, easy, easy, I got, I got this. So I was like, oh wow. I was like, oh, I know that that drum is really good as well. So I was just like, oh, this is horrible. My heart was pounding and I, I don't usually get like that. I don't get that kind of nervous. So I was like, I really, really want it. Um, went in, played the song, met John, the MD, and uh, really, really nice. And yeah, we, we vibed and then I was like, okay, cool. I nailed the song exactly how I would have played it um, and walked away and it was like two days of hell. I was just sitting there waiting for this this phone call to see if I'd be called back for the second yeah. stage audition. And the phone rang and I got the second stage and uh, there's like, right, there'll be two guitarists that we've chosen, two bass players that, that we've chosen, John, who's the keyboard player, and then two drummers. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm like the final stages. I'm pitted up against someone else and I thought it's gonna be that guy that I saw walking out, telling everyone that he's definitely got the gig, then yeah. he nailed it. And I was like, oh, more pressure, this sucks, kind of thing. I turned up to the audition and I saw two guitarists and two bass players, no other drummer. So I was like, oh, well, maybe I do this first and I leave then and he comes room, in. Yeah. And we started, I, you know, we did these like band jamming sessions with, with all the other guitarists and they kept switching the guitarists and bassists out to like different combos. But I was staying the same, so I'm still just sitting grooving out and they're swip, like swapping people out. And then we all get sent out of the room. I was like, where's this other drummer? You know, maybe he's sick, maybe he can't make yeah. it. I remember John, K John called three of us into the room, one of the guitarists, one of the bassists, and myself. He's like, right, you guys have got the gig. I was like, what? And yeah, he, he said he chose me from the beginning audition. He knew that, that I was wow. the right guy for the job uh, for whatever reason. Um, and yeah, he just I guess he just decided to really play with my nerves a bit and, and I guess give me the, the drive to want it that much more to perform that much better and to really prove that I can, I can deliver awesome. the goods, you know? Um, and then we were only meant to do, or we only thought it was like one tour with the possibility of going to America and doing like a small tour mm -hmm. as well. Cause no one knew the scale of the band at that point. And, uh, then yeah, it was, it, we did the tour and it was like mind blowing. It was the same, same thing, you know, we'd be playing 2000, 3000 capacity venues 
and there'd be another 2,000, 3,000 people outside. Like it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. So it was, uh, yeah. yeah, it was. And we have the wall, uh, that obviously led to the next several years of, yeah. of being on tour. We have the, we have a picture there of you uh, in London, right? And how many people were you playing in front of there? There's the picture right there. How many people are you, <laughs> how many like people that. is there? Uh, if that, yeah, it's Wembley. So that, that's Wembley Stadium. Oh, eight, I believe it's in like late eighty thousands. Wow. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure when when there's a soccer game going and the the, the football game going on, it's like ninety two thousand. But I think because of the size of the stage, it takes down the seats as well. So I'd say anywhere between like eighty and ninety thousand. Which, but like that's like the UK iconic stadium. Yeah. By the way, so that that's yeah. like the big moment. My cousin just saw Adele there. Oh wow. Like. I mean, the biggest names of the biggest names play there. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a dream of mine since, since I was a kid. I used to have like a little, um, what, are the, what are those little games called? Do you know the little like soccer games with the little twisty things? Ah, uh, like foosball? Yeah. yeah. I used to have one of those and it said Wembley Stadium on the side. I was like, my, my dad used to say to me as a kid, he was like, oh, that's where you want to play. I don't know whether he was referring to me playing soccer or whether he was referring <laughs> to me to drumming, but either way. Either way, it worked out. I got to kick a soccer ball around that, that place anyway just backstage yeah. so I kind of consider that I've played soccer at Wembley as well did you know in that moment like did you take a second to realize and be like this is happening I'm yeah. appreciating the moment yeah definitely um, it, we played three nights as well so so it, it was it was just a special time there was one moment in the set every night that um, we did a song called You and I and it was kind of where everything drops down all these lasers go out and it's like a beautiful setting but the song is so beautiful and I don't do anything for the first like two two minutes of the song. I just kind of sit there and the boys are singing and then we kick in for this huge thing, this big fireworks and everything. I remember looking around and John, the keyboard player and I, we were like opposite sides of the stage, but we were risen up. We both looked at each other and we we're both like, this is it. Like this is, it doesn't get much better than yeah. this, you know? I mean, this is one of the biggest venues, the most iconic venues in the world. And we're getting to play this, like no one, or very little people get to do this. And that was like, you know, brought a tear to my eye, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was uh, you're, iconic. You're traveling around, obviously you've done, you know, world tours. Basically, you know, we we're talking even before the show, you and your girlfriend comparing countries of who's been to more countries. <laughs> yeah. You spent a lot of time traveling. What, it, what are the pros and cons to that? You know, is there, obviously everyone thinks, oh, you, this is awesome, you know, world tour, it's all over the place, you're traveling. Mm. Is it is it that good? Is it that good? I mean, are it there is, yeah. Is there downtimes at all? Is there? There is. I mean, when when we were gone for like two or three months at a time, or even even longer sometimes, it was like, it was intense. You know, when we're playing a different country a day, sometimes and we're like, we have to get up at four in the morning and fly to the next place, then go and load in and do all this. You know, sometimes it did get like intense. Um, but the main thing that I used to really, really struggle with was like being homesick and being away from my family, mm -hmm. um, which is ironic that now I live five and a half thousand miles away from yeah. them. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it it was a really strange feeling because you you feel like you're on top of the world and you're you're getting to experience all these new cultures and stuff. But you know, and I'm experiencing them with like lifelong friends. I'll always be friends with with the guys in the band, mm -hmm. and, and you know, they're like family to me. And the guys in the crew as well, they're all family. But it's not the same as having your blood, your like, and, and the people that you grew up with, the people that you love. It's it's that was always the hardest thing was was experiencing all these things without them and not and not having like, you know, even just a couple of people to really share these amazing moments with and to always feel like I'm missing someone. Like that's that was my hardest thing, definitely. And that definitely, I think, for all of us, for, for everyone was like one of the biggest like killers for sure. You're talking about the, you know, how close you are with the other members of the band. Everyone is now doing their own thing. I mean, literally, it, every single member of the band has songs out, is working on music. Mm. Do you guys still uh, kind of talk and encourage each other in your individual projects and be checking in of like, oh, hey, what's going on? You're working on that? That's awesome. Like, keep it up. You know, I'm proud mm. of you type stuff. I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite good at that. I quite, I'm, I'm quite good at, like, uh, trying to keep in touch with everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, the five boys themselves, they... They, you know, they're some of the most sought after people in the world. You know, yeah. they're, they're, they're very, very busy. So to ever really pin them down to hang out is like, <laughs> it's like, like the hardest thing in the world. Um, Even like text messages though, or phone calls of just checking in and encouraging one another. Are they yeah. offering encourage, encouragement for Ever Ride or do they, 
I mean, how much is there communication still? It's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I mean, there's a, a, a message every so often, you yeah. know. Um, we, yeah, we, I'm, I've, you know, I'll always love and be in touch with them as much as I can. But mm -hmm. I mean, most of the days now, it's all just social media based stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, they're, as I said, they're crazy, crazy busy. They're all jet set. And I see one of them's in London one day and then I look at another picture. I'm like, nope, he's now in New Zealand or something crazy, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm I'm guessing. Uh, hopefully, they've they they've heard some of the stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember playing Liam some of the demos, probably a year like over a year ago. Um, and he was like, dude, you know, one thing he he, he loved to sing his voice. He was like, this guy sounds sounds great, you know. And they dug the songs. So I mean, yeah, awesome. But uh, yeah, they've they've been quiet apart from that. But hopefully, hopefully they've they've listened to it and and enjoy it a little bit the question obviously that everyone you know is wondering the band's been on hiatus mm. you know is there talks or is there any hope you think that the you know the band could get back together or yeah. is there was there ever think okay we're gonna do you know two or three years apart to be able to pursue our own projects or what do you think is the future of one direction it will it, definitely definitely come back i'm sure like i mean how can it not really um i just guess i guess for them you know the five of them or the four of them i guess now um they they're all having so much fun doing their own things and they're all super super successful mm -hmm. i mean i don't think there's been another band where every member has gone off and done something incredible you know it's always been one or two go off and become successful um i think i think there's still years years of them really finding their full potential as solo artists still um but i mean they 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 will 100 percent, i'm sure come back to being I mean they'd be stupid not to let's be honest and then who knows if they still want me to play drums for them you know when when we're all old men I don't know we'll how does <laughs> we'll how does working on individual projects I mean for you for the other members of the band being able to grow your own strengths how do you think that would help the band maybe when it comes back together um, I, d I mean yeah I guess I guess they because they were all together and and, and everyone has been put together and kind of told right you know this this is your lane this is what you're doing i think now that they've expanded out of that and they're doing things that they love like for harry he's he, he's gone off and and almost completely done something like a whole different style of music mm -hmm. and but he's like he's doing so well with it and it sounds great so i mean i think i think if they come back and they start writing new material i think it's gonna it's gonna be really interesting to see what kind of direction no pun intended um, that takes, you know. I think I think it it's gonna make some really interesting but incredible music. I, I I hope I'm a part of it still. I'd love that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've talked a lot about the you know the highs and obviously you know touring around the world and with One Direction and you know even starting the show saying that you know made 290 million dollars and set the record for the for the vocal group on tour. You know the biggest grossing tour for a vocal group. What would you say is the biggest hardship? that you've faced in life and maybe had to overcome? Uh, I mean, just thinking that you're not ever good enough, I guess, is, is something that every or most people can relate to. Um, just that kind of self-doubt, um, or, or, or even there's people there that are telling, telling us, you know, like, you can't do this, or you suck, or, or you know, really not, not filling you with the greatest of confidence. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I've always tried to come across as a very confident person. Um, but that's not always the case. Sometimes I just use that as a front because I'm not that confident, you know. And uh, I mean, that's 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 been like that for my whole life. You know, I've always been scared of, you know, scared as hell to do certain things and to really push myself, and uh, you know, turned down a lot of really cool opportunities because I thought, you know, oh, there's no way I'm going to be good enough for this, or you know. So I've I've made it so it's not been possible for myself to do it to like not go to auditions you're saying even yeah i mean even even up till recently you know just just like set certain things you know where people are like hey i'd love you to be able to do this and come and do this and, and it's like an incredible opportunity and i've just been you know you almost feel like oh i i don't think i could do it and you I, you know you, you put yourself down it's a it's a big time like i think everyone goes through that at some point where you just don't feel like you're very good uh, uh, mm -hmm. whatever it is that you do you know you kind of get a bit um anxious about it, i guess um and i mean one of the most recent things for me uh, which i think my band they they you know have really started to help me push through was i i can sing but i hate singing in front of people 
like it keeps me awake at night. Like mm. if you said to me now, sing something, I'm taking these headphones off and I'm running through that door. Like I'm like, nope. Make sure not to do that. <laughs> but like, you know, and, and it's, it sounds super simple. It sounds simple. I'll get up and sing something, you know, and it's just, it's terrifying or, 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 or it was terrifying. And we, um, yeah, we just practiced like, you know, really, really practice hard. And, and I ended up doing what I completely hated and said I'd never ever do and never thought I was good enough to do. And we did it in front of an audience, you know, as, as the band. And, and I was like, okay, cool. Once you do it, once you're like, okay, I can do this. I think I got it. Yeah. it still scares the hell out of me, but we'll still do it, you know? And, um, I mean, it doesn't sound very hard. I'm sure the people listening are going to be like, that's not that hard or like that, that that's not a real hardship, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I mean, yeah, it's career wise. It's just for me, it's, it's, it's just always been like the doubt that I can't do this or the, you know, you'll never be able to do this because of this reason, because of that reason. And I'm a very positive person. I feel like I, I hope I've come across very optimistic about everything in life. Absolutely. But there's just certain things where I'm just like, nope, not I, there's, the, there's no way you know and I, f I feel like that is such a career killer in itself especially if if you're in the entertainment business where it is all about making yourself you're putting yourself out there you're almost making yourself vulnerable and exposed so everyone can see you and yeah it's it's just it's it's just tough you know and you know we were talking about the you you possibly had the opportunity to drum for the other band when one direction ended before you even started ever ride yeah yeah well, well and that, that was had a, to cause some kind of self-doubt a little bit oh it did yeah that one that that tell was me, crazy tell me about that yeah we um well as soon as uh, as soon as one direction started the hiatus uh, i was asked to play for another band in the uk um and they were like they were just going off and doing a new tour and it was like their comeback tour from a very very long time you know and uh I remember them as a kid. I was, I was like, oh, you know, I remember, I remember these guys. This is cool. I'd love to do it. Are you, you able know. to say the band name? Yeah. But, oh, oh, the band was called oh. Busted. Okay. They're an incredible, incredible uh, band. And uh, all three guys in the band, they're a trio as well. They're all such nice guys. And, you know, uh, I, toured, I toured with a couple of them. They supported us uh, on tour throughout, I think, one of the stadium tours, wasn't it? Um, really, really cool, cool guys. I really vibe with them. And the management uh, at the time were like, Oh yeah, um, you know we'd love to get to get you in, and we did all the you know ins and outs. We worked out the contracts, we worked out the timings, and uh, at the time I was this was just as we were kind of I was I was midway through sponsoring Everide, and um, and the guys at Food for the Hungry were like, right, we need to film a documentary. This needs to be, you know, this is too good. You know, this story is amazing. We'd love you to go out, and we'd like to take you out somewhere around the world and they didn't tell me it was Rwanda at first it mm -hmm. was um, I think it was meant to be the Philippines at first but like we, you know we'd like you to see what what life is like for these people and see how you can help them just bring bring awareness we'll film like a documentary and I was like okay guys yeah but I'm just about to go off on this tour and it's going to be like really long so the dates may not match up so this may just be something that if we can we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen you know and um, yeah months went by where I was just like cool I've kind of got my next year planned out, you know, and I kind of made moves towards that planned out year. So I was meant to be moving to the States. So I pushed back my, all my green card mm -hmm. stuff, kind of put a hold on that, which is like, yeah, which is, a, I mean, it's a big, big deal. The, the, I mean, anyone that's ever tried to do immigration, you understand how horrendously crazy that, that process is. Um, and yeah, I actually, uh, it was, I think it was January. It was just before we we're about to start rehearsals. Uh, I met another a, a good friend of mine who's an insanely talented drummer, um, and uh, I asked him, "Oh, so what are you doing?" He's like, "Oh, I'm about to go out on this tour, uh, this this busted tour. I've been a huge fan since since since, since I was a kid." So I was like, "Hmm, really? You know?" But I I I, I, I didn't say, "Oh, me too." Like, what, what's this about? <laughs> yeah, you know, I just kind of kept kept it quiet. I was like, you know, either he's playing a prank or or something's gone on that I'm not quite aware of. Um, and then yeah so i i messaged the management and they were like yeah sorry we've been meaning to, to tell you um uh for whatever reason for, for you know they never said anything like yeah you're not good enough so we did this you know they're, they're just like yeah um for whatever reason we picked him sorry you know we, we were gonna tell you but it's that moment when you're in like you know the blind like you were going to tell me you've known yeah. for how however long you know and i don't i don't hold any grudges against against uh the, the people responsible, like, it, it doesn't matter to me. But it was just the principle, so I was like, ah, oh, this sucks, you know. And, but, uh, but it's amazing, because obviously through that came Everride. 
Exactly. And, like, yeah, yeah. If you hadn't have done that, so it's amazing to to see things like that in life. Yeah, it's come it's, to fruition. It's the looking back. It it was a whole. If I if I had done that tour, I wouldn't have gone to Rwanda, and I wouldn't have uh, met my ch- my my sponsor child, and none of this really would have came about. So I mean, mm-hmm. it always leads to that to that end point, which you know. I really try and live my life by now as I'm like, you know, everything happens for a reason. I really, really solidly believe that. And even though something at the time feels so like, oh, this, this really sucks, you know, <laughs> this is the worst thing ever. It will somehow, you know, it will work out and, and it's never the end. It's, it's never like the end of hope, you know. Um, is, is that the advice you have for people? You know, as we yeah. wind down, is that the, the takeaway that you have for people I and mean, the advice that you would give for someone who is, five, 10, 15 years old and is hearing mm-hmm. from teachers that, oh, you really should try another dream or this um, is just yep. a dream. What advice do you have? Do whatever makes you you happy. Never settle for what you think is the normal thing to do. You know, like everyone thinks you have to go to, to college and university. You have to get a degree. And if that's what you want to do, that's great. If you don't want to do that and you want to, you know, follow your dream, then you need to do that because, you know, people are always going to tell you, you can't do it, you can't do it. And you've almost got to drown it out and be like, I can, I can, like, you know, because if you don't believe in yourself, there ain't no way, you know, there's no chance you're ever going to be able to do it. So you need to get that into your head that it is 100% possible. And I think that will just put you in the right mindset and it will, you know, will start to make things happen in, in, in your own mind because that's where it all starts. It all starts up here. So. Yeah. And you know what? You, I appreciate you opening up about the doubt because I think that is something that a lot of people deal with. A lot of mm. people, you know, they're always facing the, the, the thought of like, you know, like you said, am I good enough? Mm-hmm. Is, this, is this really something that I'm meant to do or is this more of a hobby? Yeah. So for you opening up even, you know, especially as we've talked about, someone who has tra- literally traveled the world a- and done what so many people would like to do to hear that you still kind of face that and that's still something mm. that you kind of deal with is important, I think, for a lot of people know, to know and will inspire them as well. Awesome. So I appreciate you coming on. Next Forever Ride, you guys have filmed uh, the video for Heartless, so you're yeah, filming it coming yeah, up? Yeah, we're, we're filming in the next couple of weeks, and uh, we've got a ton of new music coming out. It's uh, it's beginning, but it's extremely exciting, yeah. Got a, awesome. got a lot, so watch this space for sure. Absolutely. Well, we're so excited, and again, thank you so much for coming on and Thanks for, for opening me. up. And thank you guys for joining us for this very first episode of I Could Never Be. Hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully you feel inspired. Hopefully you feel encouraged and motivated to go out and reach your goals. We'll see you next time. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wett. This has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only, and not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.